Hello to everyone. Welcome to a new EasyChem chat. I have the pleasure to uh, discuss today with Professor Jean-Louis Vincent from Brussels, which is not actually in Brussels, but I cannot tell, tell you where he is, <laughs> um, about fluids, fluids in the SU. Hi. Hello. Um, hello, hello. So uh, yesterday, we had the publication of the PLUS trial from the ANZIX groups, investigating again a very frequent question, by the way. Uh, which is the relevance of choosing one type of crystalloids on, let's say, clinical relevant outcomes in the ICU. Which is your first reaction to this uh, large publication in the Journal of Medicine? Well, it confirms what I said from the very beginning to you, to all people who listen to my talks on this. Of course, it's negative. It was well expected. Uh, these, you know, we know the composition of these fluids. We know what there is in it. So I don't understand this type of studies, randomizing patients for two types of fluids as if we wanted to eliminate one type of fluid and give the same type of fluid to every single individual. We need several types of fluids. It depends on the situation. Why do you want all the patients to need exactly the same IV fluid, exactly as all infected patients would need one single antibiotic? It doesn't make sense at all. So in this study, there was no significant difference. Well, there was a significant difference, but it was minor in chloride levels. And we know when we look at what there is in these solutions, we know that it's the chloride that makes a difference. 154 milliequivalents per liter in the saline solutions. That, that cannot be good if you give too much of it. We knew it before starting. So hopefully in this study, most patients did not need so much fluid and the chloride levels did not increase very much in the saline group. So of course there is no difference in outcome. Of course, this was well known from the very beginning. It's the same thing with the basic study from, uh, from Brazil. I told them, what are you doing? Why do you do that? You know, you, you give one and a half liters of a, of a study solution on the first day and half a liter on the second day, and you, you expect to see a difference in mortality? But it should be poison to see a difference in mortality. This does not make sense. We should stop doing these pragmatic trials without thinking. You know, in the initial split trial, they did not even measure chloride levels. Did you realize that? The problem is hyperchloremia, and chloride levels were not measured. What, what kind of medicine is that? I, I'm really concerned about what people have in their minds. Now, I want, of course, to challenge you one point. Um, you, so you have seen that uh, together with PLUS trial, we have uh, a meta-analysis of these, uh, uh, let's say, uh, randomized trials, uh, looking at the effect of outcome. It is true that if you combine all of these studies with more than 35 randomized patients, you see that there is a potential for a nine relative reduction of mortality related to the use. So, if I would play the uh, devil's advocate, I could say that if you treat a million of patients, this 9% small relative reduction in mortality could save hundreds or thousands of lives. So maybe there is a signal that we cannot see in the randomized trial, but do you think that related to that, we should say that at least the balanced solution should be our, let's say, first choice to start with, or you are not convinced about this? No! Oh, no, we need to individualize our therapies. We still need a doctor deciding the type of solution that he or she wants to give. And uh, of course, there could be a harmful effect of saline solutions. Giving saline solutions to patients with hyperchloremia is malpractice. Malpractice. I would not defend a doctor who would do that. I would not defend uh, him or her on court. So, uh, you know, you need to think about it. It's, a, it's very logical. So in these studies, and if you look at the SALT, the SALTED, uh, or the SMART study, 
you could see that in patients who develop hyperchloremia, renal dysfunction was actually more likely. But we knew it before starting. We know it from preclinical data, and we know it from a general concept, which is that when something is abnormal in the blood, it is statistically associated with a higher mortality. Yeah. Can you tell me an exception to that rule? Would Not you like to have hyperkalemia? Like Would you like to have hypernatremia? Would you like to have hyperproteinemia? Would you like to, whatever. It's always associated with the worst outcome. Why would hyperchloremia escape from this general okay. rule? So hyperchloremia we... cannot be good. I have never heard anybody saying hyperchloremia should be good for you. Nobody said that. So why don't we measure it very simply and adjust our treatment to what we measure as we do for blood sugar, as we do for potassium? You know, it's not so complicated after you, all. You, you made an example of antibiotics, which I like because... We know that antibiotics save life, but there might be side effects related sometimes to those. So one interpretation could be that maybe when you give only one uh, fluid type, as has been done in this study, it's a kind of those effects, which you give too much saline and you increase chloride as a side effect, this might result in potential increase in complication. That, that is more the dose. Uh, the example that sometimes I do just to challenge people is not my just to challenge people. I say, if you give 100 milliliters of HS that one is giving anymore, I'm not sure your kidney will be impaired if you are just a post-operative in the ICU because it's a dose effect. If you say that maybe in saline is the same, if you give 10 liters of saline, the chloride will go up to 130 with a nasidemia, you might have side effect. That's, that's the interpretation of one interpretation of these studies. Yeah, you don't go to, you shouldn't go to extremes, but when the chloride levels go to 106, 107, 108 milli equivalents per liter, we need to be very concerned. You know, it doesn't need to be very, very high. The comparison with antibiotics has its limitations, but you could simply compare it with potassium. And I took the comparison. Do we need a clinical trial to show that we need to give 30 milli equivalents per liter of potassium chloride in every single uh, liter of fluid that we give to our patients? Oh, we say, oh, wait a minute. If there is renal failure, I don't want to. If there is recent diarrhea, if there is metabolic alkalosis, et cetera. Why can't we do it for, <laughs> for saline versus plasma light versus Ringer's lactate solutions? They all have a place like albumin. I'm not so sure that HES solutions are so toxic, you know, but that's another story. I don't think we will go into that. But uh, the Australians showed that there was less um, renal dysfunction by rifle uh, criteria with HES solutions. But then they said, well, rifle is not good. Well, okay, but others use it and they like to use it. Okay, so uh, we need different types of IV solutions. We need some diversity. There is nothing bad in diversity. So we, we may say, for example, that there are some situation, maybe some niche situation. Example could be uh, ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, where, for example, you would start not with saline, I presume, because it's a little bit acidotic. That's, is it true? Well, except if there is profound hypovolemia, because the volume effect of, uh, of uh, saline solutions are still excellent. It is... Uh, slightly hypertonic with the 0.9% uh, cl um, sodium chloride. Um, so, but, but in general, you are right. You don't want to give saline solutions when there is uh, acidosis uh, or an acidemia in particular. When I started to teach, I, I was wrong advising to give saline solutions initially in diabetic ketoacidosis. And I, 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 you know, I, I proposed it without thinking much about it. But then I changed, of course, and now I think it's perfect to give Ringer's lactate solutions, which are somewhat hypotonic, and that could be somewhat alkalinizing because lactate can actually increase the uh, bicarbonate uh, levels uh, because it's transformed into bicarbonate. So the, um, you know, so that's a good indication for balanced solutions. 
any kind of hyperchloremia. Yes, indeed. Uh, on the other hand, alkalemia would be more in favor of the administration of saline solutions. Uh, likewise, alkalemia, yeah, did I say that? Yeah, or yes. hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, hypochloremia, which is often associated with metabolic alkalosis, would be good uh, indications for saline solutions. So why can't we teach our students about this? Is it so complicated? No, it's not. So it's you claim, of course, for individualized, as you mentioned, on patients' characteristics. Do you think that it's still true that we should never give albumin to a traumatic brain injury? No, the Australians recognized, and if you like, I have the reference from my, my good friend uh, Belomo, uh, they recognized that their albumin solution is hypotonic in Australia. So that's why it was indeed bad in traumatic brain injury. Of course, you should not give any hypotonic solution. You should not give Ringer's lactate solutions to patients with severe brain injury. So uh, that kind of limitation uh, can easily be, be uh, discussed and solved. I think it's an important message because when you see the introduction of the PLUS trial, they still uh, claim that we should not give up with 4%, not mentioning the apotonic content of the fluid. I have a last question, maybe because we rapidly talk about albumin. I'm still very puzzled on the fact that we have a trial, the Albus trial, suggesting, you know, in the SU group of patients with septic shock, that maybe albumin might have a role to impact the outcome. My question to you would be in general, do you think that when we give albumin as a fluid, particularly in patients with sepsis, are we giving albumin because patients need fluid or we should give albumin to target a level of albumin because we think on additional properties of this fluid rather than just giving back volume? It can be either one or both. It's like when to give blood. It's not only the hemoglobin concentration that should lead to the, to the decision to give blood to a patient. It's also the clinical context. Is there a coronary artery disease, et cetera? So with albumin, it's the same thing. Uh, you would give albumin when albumin levels are low and when there is a context of risk of multiple organ failure because edema is never good for the organs. And there is, of course, excellent evidence from physiology, pathophysiology, randomized control trials. Then when you add uh, some, uh, some albumin, there is less edema formation. You need to give less fluid. Would this is give... absolutely evident. There is no doubt about this. Would you give albumin in RDS patients? Some people claim we should not. No, 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 you, you should. Now, if the patient is normal volemic initially, and if you are concerned uh, about the expansion of the blood volume, you should add some diuretics or use ultrafiltration. Now, but if the patient needs fluids and if the patient has a LDS, yes, of course, yeah, no, no doubt about this, the administration of, uh, of albumin if there is hypoalbuminemia and lots of edema. I mean, I have to thank you to have been very clear on a so complex topic in only 10 minutes. And of course, I invite everyone to be in Brussels in March that we will have much more debate on the Floyd issue, on the fluid issues with many other colleagues. So thanks a lot and see you. And measure chloride levels, measure yeah. chloride levels. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, the last words. And see you, of course, in the next EasyChem chat. Yeah, bye-bye. We'll see you soon. Take bye -bye. care, bye-bye. Thank you.